Some information about the earliest version of the game. Did you know that the undead were originally supposed to look more... human-like? In an interview with the Vanilla WoW developer, they talk about how the undead were originally planned to basically decay over time. They were supposed to start off looking human, and then slowly as they progressed through the starting zone, they would lose their flesh, culminating at the end of the starting zone where the Forsaken would look like the ones we have today. But the reason they abandoned this feature was because they just did not have the tech to pull it off at the time. And also, the undead areas were the last ones to be added to the original game, so they definitely did not have time to flesh out the zone where they really like their ambitious pre-planning stages. Although it would have been a neat feature to have lore-wise, to see the undead slowly decay as you come to terms with your character's new existence. And they kind of pulled this off with the Worgen starting zone, where you start off as a human and then slowly turn into a Worgen. Although the Worgen have the ability to swap between their human form anyway, and they already have human models in the game, so that one was a no-brainer to add to their starting zone. And also, did you know, if you leave the Worgen starting zone before you get bit by a Worgen, you just automatically learn how to turn into a worgen once you enter combat for the first time. It used to be you could stay in human form forever if you managed to escape, but they fixed that after a couple of expansions. Located in the Death Knight starting zone are a series of skeleton NPCs known as the Scourge Sky Darkeners, whose only job is to rain arrows upon the nearby town the Death Knight are attacking. One of the skeletons will offer you a quest called Tonight We Dine in Havenshire, which has you go around the town in order to collect some of the Serenite arrows that they've been raining down because they're only found at Northrend and they're in limited supply. Now, this quest, as well as the NPCs, are all obvious references to the movie 300, as one of the lines in the movies is, Spartans, ready your breakfast and eat hearty, for tonight we dine in hell. And also, there's a scene in the movie where the Persian army threatens the Spartans by saying they have so many soldiers on their side that their arrows will blot out the sun, to which they reply that they'll just fight in the shade then. Hence the name of the Sky Darkeners of the Bowman Skeleton, which is just further reinforced by the name of the quest that they provide. In Alpha WoW, before they had talent trees which went live in the classic version of the game, all players had this talent point interface, which would allow you to spend your talent points in order to increase the power level of your character. Like if you wanted to increase the damage with two-handed axes specifically, you could spend 10 talent points to increase it by one. If you wanted some fire resistance, you could spend 10 talent points to increase it by four, increasing it as you bought more of the ranks. This system is also where you would get your professions, so you'd have to choose to give up player power in order to be able to craft items and consumables. Eventually, this system was scrapped, and then players were given the talent trees in beta, which stayed in the game all the way until Mist of Pandaria. Although this little window of purchasing specific skills wasn't entirely abandoned either, as the Hunter class had a very similar window in order to train their pets. Whereas, when your pet would level up, they would gain loyalty points, which you would then use to purchase their basic attacks, cooldowns, and all of their extra stats, like granting extra armor, health, and very specific resistances. So you could choose to give your pet a lot of fire resistance, and have no frost resistance at all, for example. And the original pet training panel was incredibly unintuitive, and would show you skills that you couldn't actually train your active pet, and didn't have a way to sort the abilities at all, so just kind of a mess that was abandoned in Wrath of the Lich King. So they did kind of keep the old talent point system, it was just stripped of its previous functionalities and only applied to hunter pets. Located in Area 52, during the second to last quest of the quest chain provided by Dr. Vomisa PhD, is a quest known as You Robot, which has you test drive a robot against another one named Negatron. Now, during the quest chain, you've basically been helping this guy test drive his robots and gathering parts for him. So during this final test drive of the robot, you're supposed to fight against a Fell Reaver who is an obvious reference to Megatron, the big bad evil guy of the Transformer series, which is a cartoon and movie franchise about robots that can transform into different things. And during the Burning Crusade, this was a pretty difficult quest to solo, and was supposed to be helped along by the robot that was provided by you, which could be accidentally dismissed if you summoned another temporary pet as part of your class. Now, the enemy bad guy Negatron also has some dialogues which are very reminiscent of his Saturday morning cartoon villain status that it's based on, where he'll say things like, Ha ha ha, your feeble rocket is destroyed. I'll return later to finish off the rest of your puny town, but he says this in all caps, of course. And the quest it's associated to is itself a reference to the short story and full-length movie, I, Robot, which doesn't really have anything to do with this quest or Transformers, other than the fact that they both have robots in them. In the game files and even some of the promotional materials for early Vanilla WoW, there's a place known as the Dragon Isles which was eventually cut from the game for a whole bunch of reasons. One of the biggest reasons that we found out, thanks to the WoW Diary book, is that the Dragon Isles didn't really make sense from a lore standpoint. 
In Warcraft lore, all of the dragons are good except for the black dragons. So they couldn't easily make a zone for adventurers to go into to kill stuff because there's so few variations of bad dragons. And there were already a couple of zones with black dragons in the game as enemies already. In fact, some of the developers asked Chris Metzen, the guy responsible for a lot of WoW's lore, to just let them make other colors of dragons enemies. That way they could have more variation to their enemies, but he always just gave them a hard no, because that's not how his lore worked out. So every time you fight a dragon in-game that's not a black dragon, there's always some special reason they're an enemy, usually due to madness or mind control or something, and rarely because of something they did of their own volition. However, another reason the Dragon Isles was cut was because they were having a hard time just designing the place. And a lot of the neat, fancy ideas they had just didn't flow very well with character models they were actually trying to put in them to test. And lastly, they found out they didn't actually need very many zones or dungeons. You see, what happened was they had planned for the Dragon Isles as well as the zones of Grim Batol, Tol Barad, and Karazhan to be in Vanilla WoW. And one of the things Vanilla WoW did that no other game did at the time was trying to navigate players through a zone by giving them breadcrumb quests that they can send them places. And during the Friends and Family Alpha, players really loved the quest and wanted more of them. So they added extra quests to have players do more things inside the zones, rather than just send them to far reaches of the zone to explore and grind mindlessly. And as quoted by the WoW Diary book, the only way to keep players in an appropriate zone was by adding far more quests than originally planned. By creating so many quests, WoW had accidentally created compelling solo content which arguably became the game's strongest ingredient for success with the broad market of casual players. Providing that much enjoyable solo content was never planned, budgeted, or even prioritized. It was stumbled upon. By trying to solve a navigation problem, we'd inadvertently engaged a larger audience, namely the solo players. So because of the game design of creating more quests to do in a zone, they didn't actually need to create as many zones as they thought they would. So they cut a couple of their planned zones so they could save them for later with Dragon Isles being the only one from that list that has still yet to make it to the game. And just for some context on how many quests Vanilla WoW had compared to its competitors, a single zone in World of Warcraft had more quests than the entire game of EverQuest. WoW has had many battlegrounds over the years. However, did you know there are three unused battlegrounds almost fully completed in the files? First off, we have Azhara's Crater. A battleground I'm sure some of you know of was originally planned for Vanilla WoW, and it was even given a location in Ajara, a large crater made into the map, with roads even put for Alliance and Horde to get there. But there was nothing ever done with this place. Also, sadly, as this map was removed, so we can't view it anymore, and its final complete state is not even visible in the map files, so we'll be using some footage from Haven Games for this section. The first real version of this map appears in 0.9 beta for WoW Vanilla, and appears to have some massive crater set in Ajara, with a Night Elva village and Orc town set within. On top of that, a couple of ruins, and that's about it. It was super basic, but quite large. Then comes 0.10, the map is completely changed, this version being three craters connected by gates between the cliff sides, with assumed a horde camp in the bottom left, and alliance camp in the north. This version is much more complete, although even then, the next update to the zone would come in patch 1.0. The alliance camp would be massively reverted, becoming far more basic, oddly enough, which will be followed up by the final version, a complete version that's map file has been all too hard to acquire, giving a full scale to the area, but has yet to be used. This zone is so complete, people have even been able to make a fan-made map of the area. The battleground is assumed to have worked in the same vein as Alteric Valley, with resources and capture points, pushing into your enemy's land and securing structures, although with only one faction camp each, it seems this may have been a bigger focus on capturing neutral objectives and gathering resources, to use to defeat your enemy, instead of them simply being buffs that you need to take out so you can defeat their enemy boss. This battleground is fully set up aesthetic-wise, so all the groundwork is done for Blizzard to finally give us this BG, although I guess the visuals are a bit outdated now. Next we have Defend of the Ale House, and this time map files that are actually still in-game. So this BG was added in patch 5.4.7, meaning at the end of Mist of Bandaria, and just sat untouched since. This map has a Horde and a Lion side, and the Horde a more autumn appearance and the Alliance a more spring. This map very much has a MOBA-like appearance, and may have been planned to be exactly that, as the name Defense of the Alehouse is a reference to the original MOBA Defense of the Ancients, and shares a lot of similarities. First off, with multiple lanes where NPCs would path down to fight each other, with players supporting them, while there is multiple side objectives, a Jade Tiger Shrine and Shaw-infested outcrop on the east, and a ruined tree husk and Mogu encampment to the west. 
This BG really does look well made, and with its somewhat up to date appearance, could be added if Blizzard figures out how to make a MOBA work in WoW. And our last of the three is simply called Warcraft Heroes. Added to the game files with the launch of Wola de Draenor, this map very much also gives off the appearance of a MOBA. Seems at the end of MOB, Blizzard really wanted to try making a WoW MOBA battleground, as with how close these are together, I assume both were in the works at the same time. Especially as these two BGs came out around the same time as Heroes of the Storm, which was a MOBA game that Blizzard had developed themselves. Maybe some practice for them, maybe a planned crossover, we may never know. But enough about all that. This zone has a very obvious Horde half and Alliance half. The zone is overall rather basic, with overall rather little work done, especially with the pathing and seemingly NPCs placed and planned, replaced by placeholder ogres, and with this there seems to be camps of mobs near the edge, much like you would see in the MOBA's jungle, even including a boss ogre. So there is many things we can gather from this, and this very well could have simply been an extremely early concept of Ashram, as it does fit into the same style, but most likely this was another attempt at making a WoW MOBA battleground, simply to the fact that multiple lanes, and even there being jungle enemies, even harking back somewhat to Warcraft 3. There is one more unused battleground called Kaladar, but I've already covered that one in depth in a different video. Long story short, it's a MOBA looking BG based on Teldrassil added in vanilla. All three of these maps are really well done, and it's a shame that at least for Ajar's Crater and Defense of the Yell House, they are pretty much entirely complete, but simply missing the mechanics required to play them. It would be nice to see them finally released in the game, although I'm sure Ajar's Crater would have to come in some time walking event or a classic plus but let's hope these broken BGs get their time to shine. Maybe even in some kind of Warfront return, as the best way to make a WoW MOBA in the BG may be to amalgamize the Warfront system.